Thanks for <laughs> thanks for coming. I always think that no one's going to show up to these things. So I appreciate you all spending your lunch hour here. Pizza helps, huh? Um, so I'm not really I don't I haven't really worked in the fine art area in a long time. Um, I'm going to hand this book around. This is just uh, um, some of my commercial work, just so maybe you kind of get an idea of what it is that I normally do. Uh, I I uh, I went to uh, engineering school for three years at the University of Michigan, and then I went to art school at Western, and eventually ended up with a Master of Fine Arts degree in painting. But I worked as an industrial designer for about 16 years designing uh, car interiors mostly and some toys and uh, for a company called Lear Corporation. None of that stuff is in the book. Um, <clears throat> but then I uh, got tired of that and then I, I, when I got my master's degree, it was always kind of going to school, taking classes, I decided that I would uh, become a freelance illustrator, graphic designer even though I've never actually done graphic design in my entire life. <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking, but <laughs> uh, what I figured was for every illustration job out there, there's about 100 graphic design projects if you're a freelancer. So if I could get the graphic design projects, I could hire myself to do the illustration, right? And so that was my approach. And that actually worked quite well, right? It worked really well. And all my projects ended up requiring illustrations somehow, <laughs> you know, so I kept myself pretty busy as, a, as an illustrator too. Um, so I did that for uh, a while and uh, for those of you who are, are uh, thinking you might become a freelancer of some kind, uh, I met a lot of other freelance artists along the way. There's chairs over here if you guys want to sit down. and. Uh, the general concession, and it was true for me too, was it takes about two years to get a freelance business going, generally speaking. So you have to have uh, two years of some way to eat, feed yourself. This was probably the trickiest part of the whole thing. I saved a lot of money when I worked for the, the car companies. I was making really good money after a while. And so I was able to stuff enough money away that I could actually not make a dime and feed myself and live frugally for for two years. And fortunately, I didn't have. Fortunately, I did make a little bit of money, <laughs> you know, the first couple of years. But I was able to. That was the only way I was able to really do that. Plus, I didn't really know anything about graphic design, so some of my stuff really didn't look that good right away, honestly. And I had to sort of learn that trade. So, uh, but I, uh, anyway, I did. I do have an MFA, and while I was in school, I would exhibit. I exhibited around the Kalamazoo area for probably 12 years, pretty regularly, and entered all the jury shows, and had one-person, two-person shows, and that. I, I never made hardly any money off of the fine art. I did have a gallery affiliation with a gallery called Images down in Kalamazoo for a few years, and sold drawings for pittances. <laughs> you know, um, so anyway, I'm revisiting the the, the fine art now because uh, I thought that um, um, you know when you go on sabbatical, you're supposed to. Uh, uh, I think it's a chance to explore, you know, uh, something that's going to hopefully have some value to the school. And uh, we just became a laptop school, and I thought I might explore what that would mean for, could mean, not would mean, for a fine artist. Um, so even though what I did here, I would not necessarily recommend for anybody else, which is I set up some rules for this show that I would only use my laptop and that I would not draw. I would not use a tablet or anything. In fact, my initial goal was I would only use the little pad, right? But I started to get carpal tunnel, so I did, I did get the mouse out. <laughs> um, so the idea is what, you know, what could you really do as a fine artist with this little box right here? Could this really, 
could this be your studio, period, end of story. Um, so I'll set this here. And this is a standard issue machine. I did not hot rod this up at all. It's just exactly what you guys have. There's nothing special about it. Um, <clears throat> like I said, I don't necessarily recommend that that's what anybody else should be doing. I probably would not even do that again myself. But I thought in the process of doing that, I would learn some things about, you know, some processes. And that if I limited myself that way, it would be an interesting thing to do. So my influences... Uh, are generally, uh, oh, and my wife and I run an uh, 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 online art gallery right now called visualpump.com, and the art that we, that we carry on there is, are prints, like these G. Clay prints, and uh, by a variety of artists. I've um, been trying to do that for a few years now with some marginal success, pretty marginal, actually. <laughs> But we do. We have sold some prints. We we started out with a wide range of work and discovered that really the only thing we seem to be able to sell were uh, abstract, large abstracts. That seemed to be a niche that we finally kind of found. And those abstracts are are bought by interior designers, and they are generally purchased in the sense that they are a component of interior design. You know, it's one way to look at art. You know, we tend to look at art usually as a a picture is sort of a standalone item, not necessarily as an element of interior design. But there's a lot of art. I think it's a it's an interesting niche. I think it's an interesting way to approach art if you wanted to. If you're interested in that, is is to think in terms of uh, um, <clears throat> it's it's part of a whole. It's not the whole thing in itself. And these are designed to tile, and that's what the little images next to them. They're designed to uh, expand and fill up an entire wall, however large that wall might be. So they're really a, one piece of a pattern. And that's what I was trying to show with the, uh, with the pieces that are, standing, that are next to them, is what they would look like and how they tile together. Kind of like wallpaper. It's kind of a weird place to be with a fine art print. In this, you're sort of like in the wallpaper <laughs> arena all of a sudden. So. Um, explaining what the difference is there can be a little tricky. I think the main thing is the difference between a tiled image like this and wallpaper is, uh, one, these are limited editions. Wallpaper, generally speaking, is not. So um, there's that exclusivity that you get with a limited edition print. Also, uh, they're relocatable. You know, you're not gluing them <laughs> down. So uh, um, you can take them with you. I guess it would probably be the two main differences there. My other influence is the uh, the large the high def TV over the fireplace. <laughs> Isn't that a crazy image? You know, this is what people's um, there's a few of those. Those that's what uh, people's interior spaces, their living rooms, I guess, are starting to look like now, especially the people with the money, who are the people that can far afford to buy art, usually. And uh, the question um, arises, uh, what do you do with that thing when you're not watching TV? Because it's pretty ugly when it's turned off. It's just a big black, you know, empty void. And there's some artists, there's a few other artists on the web that are starting to try to create media art media that would go on to uh, a thing. It's sort of, and again, now all of a sudden you're in this arena of screensaver, which is not exactly usually considered high art, <laughs> you know, the fish and stuff. So you have that challenge of trying to convince somebody that, um, you know, this is not a, you know, a screensaver. It's a piece of art. And again, the difference would be, it would be a limited edition. So not everybody, you know, has some exclusivity. And hopefully, it might be a little more sophisticated, <laughs> you know, the fishbowl uh, screensaver, you know, if I'm doing my job right. Hopefully, it would be a little more interesting than that. And that's what these are, even though they're on two computers. It's the idea of trying to uh, find something that could go on there. My idea might be that <clears throat> you buy a print, and then you may, this may seem a little crass, but you buy a print, we'll throw the animation in for free, right? It's like bonus. 
hey, I'm a commercial artist, you know, so that's the way I think. <laughs> um, the reason you can do that is the cost to make that print with printing and stretching, varnishing, shipping, you know, it's probably three, three hundred, four hundred dollars. I can burn a DVD for 50 cents, you see. So even though I have labor into this, cost of production so low, I can just throw it in, you see, and it doesn't, it doesn't hurt me. Um, any questions about that marketing approach? So these prints are sold online. This, this computer over here has the visualpump.com website on it. I just let it run through an animation because nobody in galleries wants to touch the mouse for some reason. They'll never click on anything hardly, so I just ran it through. So you can kind of see the types of views that we put together. The challenge with the online art gallery, I believe, has been to get people to feel like they've gotten a good enough look at the art, they feel comfortable buying it. You know, it's, it's pretty tricky um, because we're so used to seeing the real thing, <laughs> you know, uh, under gallery lighting and, uh, and uh, kind of knowing what you're going to get before you buy it. I think it works not too bad for prints because prints don't really have that much surface like a painting or sculpture in that, so you don't have to try to capture that anyway. Um, they're pretty flat. We have, uh, we tried to think of one thing that we could do like, what was an experience that you could have that you can't actually have in a real art gallery? And we came up with this idea called an art fitting. So people send us photographs of their space, and we actually um, Photoshop different artworks into that space, all in perspective with the proper shadows and everything, so that they can act we actually fit the art into their space to help them make selections. And uh, some people really... Uh, even asked us to uh, like change the color of their couch. Let's try a red rug. What if we painted this wall? All of a sudden, we're like in, sort of backed into the interior design business a little bit. One thing that we hoped when we started the gallery was our initial thought was it was going to be a very hands-off thing. We would just post the art. We have a shopping cart system. We take Visa. People would just buy it, we wouldn't have to deal with them. <laughs> you know, it would just be sort of this automated thing. That turned out to be very wrong. Um, we have to, you generally, I would say, have a dialogue with a potential buyer for two to three months before we actually close the deal. And, it's, and, and they really want to uh, um, see the artworks in their space and think about it, and then they have to think the money, and then they want to negotiate the price, and if I buy t three of them, do, you know, and this and that. And then sometimes you do all that work with them, and then they, they never end up buying, and then, you know, you just wasted all that time. So it's turned out to be a lot more labor involved in closing a deal. And I think probably a gallery owner would probably say, well, yeah, of course you dummy, that's how it works. What were you thinking? People were just going to go to your website, click the Buy Now button, and drop, you know, $900 on a piece of art. They have to be, you know, they want it to be catered to for a while. So we learned a little something about selling art, which was not a business I had ever really been in before either. So it's been a big learning curve for me there. Um, so that's the business model. So this, this show hopefully kind of, I think the most interesting thing about it is the, is the business model. The fact that I can have this laptop, this can be my studio, I can make this art. I can be in visiting my sister in Long Beach, California. I can receive an order. I can be doing the art fittings and dialoguing with the client and, and while I'm on vacation. I can close the deal, get the order. I send the order over to the printer because I don't want to touch the damn art, right? I don't just kidding. <laughs> but I, 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 I'm a painter, right? So I love that stuff too. But in this case, I don't, have to, I don't have to make it. I have a production house that makes it. So I don't have to be there. They make it. 
frame it. This is called order fulfillment. They make it, and I trust them. We've proofed everything. I know exactly what it's going to look like. They have total control over their process. I know that every print's going to look exactly the same. They're, they're an outstanding printing source. Uh, although I did print these at school because I wanted to. It's the same exact printer that my source has. Same exact machine. So, same results. Um, so they print it, stretch it, varnish it, put it in the box, and ship it for me. And, and I'm done. I made the sale. I can make these sales wherever I'm at, anywhere in the world, no matter what I'm doing. So I don't. I don't have. It's and. Um, I don't have to have inventory, which is another big part of the business model. And that's why G. Clay prints, these are called G. Clays, are s becoming so popular. And uh, litho edition, or woodcuts, a lot of these. I'm not really a printmaker either, so I, I, don't, I don't know it as well as a lot of you guys do. But um, I do know that, generally speaking, you have to make inventory because the setup is somewhat elaborate. So you generate all of your inventory... And you have that cost of the production of the inventory and the cost of um, storing the inventory. And you just hope that you sell them all, right? Because you, you can get stuck. Inventory is a, always a big cost for any business. Uh, and this is no inventory. This is print on demand. I don't have to. My inventory is virtual. Is virtual. It's digital. We have, if we were to sell every single piece of art on Visual Pump, which we never will even remotely approach. But if we were ever to be so lucky, I think there's about two and a half million dollars of inventory on there that we probably invested about two thousand dollars in producing. Because all we have to do is make proofs, which does cost some money, proof sheets, and we proof everything four or five times to get the color right. And we do have, um, you have to buy data storage, you know, so there's a little bit of cost, but it's it's nominal, <laughs> you know, compared to what it used to be. And I think that's why, whether you think this is a, a nice print or not, um, compared to other printmaking methods, in, the, in a marketplace, and the art market is a true marketplace, cost is a huge factor. And if there's a big enough cost benefit to creating prints a certain way, and the prints are deemed good enough, good quality, then the market can move that direction pretty quickly. And I think it has. The probably one of the most prestigious printmaking houses in the world, Gemini Gel. You guys heard of Gemini Gel? Anybody? They do the printmaking for many blue chip artists. Rauschenberg and, and the Warhol State and Robert Longo and, and all these people. And uh, they're all, make, they're all making G-Clay prints now. So whether or not a G-Clay print is a valid print in the art marketplace has already been established. That's a done deal. Whether or not you as an artist think it's an interesting way to print is a personal choice, of course. But the marketplace has accepted these already as valid fine art limited edition prints. Um, the interesting thing about these is you also see them in department stores, right? Go to, you know, J.C. Penney's and they get a whole wall of them. But you know those prints uh, that are those canvas stretch prints you see at J.C. Penney's, they're the they used to be lithos on paper, which is also a very you know there's a there's a way to you know like hand pull and hand make a litho right that has a unique look on fine art paper. I would say there's a similar difference between what you can do with a G-clay print on canvas or paper. You know you can do a really crisp, nice print, or you can do a print that looks like a photograph <laughs> of traditional media, and what it really looks like is a reproduction, right? And that's what we try to not do. Even uh, the prints that we've made that started with traditional media, and we worked with the artist, we said, hey, you know, this is a new medium, our goal is not to just make it look like the painting that it started with. Although that's not necessarily a bad thing. But now that we got it on the computer, here's an opportunity to maybe shift color a little bit. Maybe it's black and white. Maybe we tint it a little bit. You know, you can do things to it. And then that version of that image only exists in that uh, print edition. So it becomes, even sometimes in a subtle way, 
um, a separate set of artwork from the original that it was started from. And so there's only, if there's an edition of 100, only 100 editions of versions and editions of that image exist, and they are different, and they're a different entity from the original that they started from. So there's, and now these were created all on a computer, so this is the only way they could exist in print form. There's no other way to really make them. And when I think when you go down that road, digital art, um, in some way it almost feels more like a valid form of printmaking because there's no other way I could do it. <laughs> you know, the, the method, the output is tied to the process kind of more solidly, I think. Does anybody want to um, have a question or want to have another opinion on this whole idea of the fact that the, I'm calling these fine art prints? What's your edition? 50, I believe. And that actually, uh, yeah, I think we did 50. Yeah, 50. This is one of 50. And I, I'm glad you asked that because it reminds me to talk about these. People are wondering, well, what the heck are those stupid little certificates? Well, if you don't touch the art, right, if I'm in Long Beach, I can't sign it. But i got to have some way to, to say this is an authentic limited edition print. And this is, I didn't invent this. Um, <clears throat> this is the way a lot of G. Clay uh, prints are, are shipped out, even from Gemini Gel. You have a certificate. They come with a, they go with a certificate. I pre-signed the certificates, right? And then they're at the they're at the uh, printer, and then you just have to pull a certificate, put it in the box, and we just register that we you know we sold another one. So <clears throat> we've we've never sold out any of our editions, so um, not even close. But the art gallery is is not been that successful. I, I don't know that. Um, I mean, we're not losing money or anything. We're making a little bit of money, but not much. The We might be a little early in that market, or maybe that market's never really going to develop, or maybe our artwork sucks. <laughs> you just never really know, you know. Um, but we've tried a lot of different things, and we've had a big, wide range of art on the site. And uh, I think we might be in the marketplace just a little bit early. I think I would offer this caution. Most of, there are a lot of online art galleries out there. Most of them are making money off the artists. And, and one reason why we're not exactly getting rich is because we're not doing that. Most, most of these art galleries ask you to pony up some money to be on their gallery. So once they have that, they don't care if you sell or not. They got their money, right? Putting, once a, once a the website's built. The, the cost to me to put you on my gallery is, is nothing. It's, it's just a half a day's work, you know. And if I can get you to pay me $500 or $1,000 annual fee to go on my gallery and I can find 100 of you to do that, all of a sudden I'm making, that's how I'm making my money. I don't care if your stuff sells or not. And that's the, that's the truth of it out there. So you really want to be very wary, I think, of online art galleries. The more I research it, the more I realize that that's how, that's how the galleries are making their money, as usual, <laughs> you know, off the artist. Um, so let's talk about how I make these, these things. You might be interested in that. Uh, this is, I started with a computer model of a lily. I have a garden. I'm a gardener. And uh, this is uh, based on a lily that was growing in my, my garden. And this is a version of it that has some surfaces put on it. Once you have a 3D model of something, you can apply all kinds of different surfaces to it. Now, this, is, this was a way for me to create uh, shapes without drawing, which is one of my rules, remember. And, and don't get me wrong, I have nothing against drawing. I draw. I love to draw. But it was just, I just thought, well, what if, I did, what if I didn't allow myself to do that? What could I do? You know, it might be an interesting experiment. So this is how I could make a drawing. I could make a 3D model. This is a photograph of a rose from my garden, and that's in the center of, like, that piece. And I took it in the computer, and I wanted it to be this sort of X shape, so I was able to get petals from different roses. Did you use a tablet? 
No. I mean, I have a tablet and I use it, but I didn't allow myself on this because that would be drawing, right? Yeah, that's yeah. what I was saying. I was like, oh, yeah. No, I, I have a tablet. I love the tablet, but I just didn't allow myself to use it. Um, but I wanted to get an X shape, so I was able to get petals from different flowers, piece it together in Photoshop, use this tool called the um, Liquify and kind of stretch them out a little bit and make my little flower X. So this is the sort of the basis of, of where these started. Pass that around. And then my initial idea was I would just make this flower and, and I would, in the 3D modeling program, you can do things with a camera that a real camera can't do because it's a, like a fictional camera. You can get close into things and they're still in focus, like everything is in focus that you can't do with a macro camera. So you can get some real interesting views. And I had done some of that work and incorporated into some of my graphic designs before. So I made those, and the problem was is that they looked like a lot of other artwork that I'd seen before. And I just thought, well, it's just not that interesting. So in my frustration, I decided, well, I'm going to just cut it up and start. I, one of our other artists was working in patterns like this, repeating patterns. So I'll try that. So I made it like an exploded view with my 3D model. You know how they do those in, in machine, <laughs> you know, and, and how to put things together stuff from, from uh, Kmart, you know. So I did made one of those. I cut it up into four pieces, and then I put the four pieces back together like that. And then you automatically get these symmetrical patterns. And then I took those... And I kind of overlaid them a few different ways, and lo and behold, I got this big X. And, I have, and the interesting thing about this, doing this is you never know what you're going to get. It's a total mystery. It's like Jean Arp throwing the you know, pieces of the, the cut paper over his shoulder and turning around and asking himself whether he should glue them down or not. <laughs> you know, so I got, and I, and I had made a bunch of these. This is, the, this is the keeper one. This is the one I like the most. So I kept that one. And you can see that that's, that's in those images. Th these are a bunch more tests that I did. I got to the point where I could, just, I could just crank these things out by the dozens. You could just, it almost got to be too easy. I would just make these models, throw surfaces on them, cut them into pieces, flip them around, overlay them on top of each other, and just, I could just crank these things out like crazy. So here's, uh, here's a few sheets of these patterns that I made. And this is another one. This is one where I started to play around with what I might be able to do inside of it. So that's how, that's how I ended up making them. I thought they ended up, uh, when you see them, you'll see they look a little slick and science fiction-y, like they're out of a science fiction, fantasy sort of game or something. And I don't play those games. That's, you know, I don't do that stuff. That's just not me. So even though I thought they looked kind of cool and they could probably fit in that genre... I didn't feel like that had anything to do with me, <laughs> you know. So I thought I gotta, I gotta dirty these things up. I have to. I, and I, I don't want them to feel like um, slick illustration, even though I love slick illustration. That's not what I was sort of set out to make, you know. So I, um, I got these patterns into Photoshop. And the other part about the patterns that I didn't like is they were just patterns. Like they didn't feel like they were a picture of anything. They were just these patterns. And the whole thing was supposed to be florals, right? <laughs> so I could get a flower back in there somehow. So that's when I went out the garden, took the photos, and put the tiny little pictures of the flowers in the middle of them. And I just kind of made them into big frames. And, uh, and then I took photographs of uh, old buildings and a hubcap, I think it was. And I just made patterns out of those. And in, and in Photoshop, you can just lay that stuff over like texture. There's a layer mode. You can just lay it on there as if it was painted right on top of it. And that's mostly in these. There's all that textures from photography, because remember, we're not allowed to draw, right? <laughs> and so I got all that from them. <clears throat> the surfaces here are not so much from photography uh, as just standard Photoshop filters, which you always have to be very careful with because... We can spot those a mile away, right? <laughs> so I, I, I tend to use the really old, old school ones, the ones that were like in Photoshop version 2. I still think they're the best ones, but got a little bit of, uh, sorry, I'm walking off the camera there. This is just a little standard filter. 
A lot of bevel and emboss. Everybody knows the bevel and emboss tool in Photoshop. I just use that. Um, these lines, this sort of uh, gridded, sort of weird curvilinear grid thing, is done by taking a, just a, something that has a, a very light gradient fill to it. So that whole pattern emerged from all this cutting and pasting and overlapping that I was doing with the flower 3D model. But it was very light, like the darkest tone to the lightest tone, there was a very little difference. If you get a tone like that in the computer and then you increase the contrast dramatically, the computer resolves that by breaking it up into shapes. And it just generates those for you. And again, you know, I'm never exactly sure what you're going to get. But it's usually, but you know, and there's a lot of times you just end up thinking, oh, that looks like crap. But sometimes it comes out really nicely. So uh, that's all all computer generated. So basically this is all 3D model photography in Photoshop. I work at 150 pixels per inch. I know you all are probably thinking you need to work at 300, but I can assure you that if I was to print that at 300 and I hang it next to it, you would not be able to tell the difference, I guarantee you. You're all way over, over resolutioned. No, you're right, I did use a camera. But you know, if you have a studio, like a physical studio, you wouldn't consider the camera a part of the studio, would you? Not really. It'd be like a piece of equipment that you own. It's not really part of the studio space. So that's my argument there. I thought somebody would ask me that. <laughs> it's a fair question. I, I use like a, I have a, like a 10 megapixel camera. I paid about $400 for it. It's not an SLR. It's got a, like a zoom lens and a nice little flip out back. So it's not like a super fancy camera. I'm not a great photographer. I've, I've, I've taken a lot of photography over the years because when you become a graphic designer and illustrator, you end up doing that. But you know, if you know Photoshop really well, you just have to be in the ballpark with the photography. <laughs> you know, and then you can just fix it all up and make it look like it's supposed to. And that's pretty much where I'm at with photography. Yeah. Uh, that depends on what kind of deal you have with your printer. We we have a deal worked out where we we buy by the square inch, seven cents per square inch. Uh, that print right there, I'm going to guess, is around two hundred dollars to print, maybe one eighty, something like that, because it goes. 44 inches by 44 inches square. So actually, when you make the print, you don't do any touch to like uh, make a thing on the end. No, you could. You know, some artists do that. They actually print over, you know, on top of each one. But I don't want to have to leave my vacation <laughs> to make the art if I can help it. <laughs> So I'd rather just print and go, you know. Like I said, our initial idea was it would be very hands-off, you know. It would be a very automated process of making art. I mean, you have to ask yourself, what do you want to do? Do you want to make art? Do you want to, I mean, this way you can really focus on creating. Just creating, right? You don't have to get involved in all that extra process, which I know a lot of people love. But after you've worked in art and design for 30-some years like I have, the thrill starts to wear off a little bit of all the production process. And really the idea of just being able to just create, create, have somebody else make it for you, gets kind of interesting. You know, a lot of artists, and I'm not a famous, I mean, I'm, I'm anti-famous, if anything. I'm a, but, you know, a lot of well-known artists have minions that do an awful lot of that work for them, you know, because they can. I think that's probably... A really nice place to be if you can if you can have people if you can just focus on the creating and have other people do a lot of the building and the process for you it could be could be nice eventually um, so that was the goal there any other questions about that stuff how much time do I have left I don't have my watch with me what time is it 
Oh, I'm not doing too bad. Okay. Now everybody's got to get to class. So I could talk about these now for ready to move on. How I made these. These are, when I built these files, um, I kept a, more layers than I normally would have. If you ever worked in Photoshop, you know, everything's in layers. I kept like every single dinky, tiny, stupid element on there is on its own layer. That, that file that made that print was about one and a half gigabytes. It would take like, uh, yeah, it would take like 15, 15 minutes just to open it up. You know, you'd like push the open button and go make coffee. <laughs> Come back, you know, and it would take about that long to save it too. So it's a little nerve wracking because you don't just hit the save button willy nilly when it takes 15 or 20 minutes to save, you know. Now, if I would have hot rodded my machine up a little bit, which I kind of wish I would have now, it would have gone a little bit faster. But, you know, that was my rule. I was going to use the standard issue machine, you know, so I didn't do it. Um, one tip I can give you, because I know a lot of you probably work in Photoshop a lot, um, RAM memory is a big deal for Photoshop. So if you can buy a little bit more RAM memory for your computer, that's the cheapest way to kind of make it better. But you all have external hard drives now, right, because you back up your files daily. And, <laughs> and if they're a FireWire drive, and you plug that FireWire drive in here, there's something in Photoshop called Image Cache that you can set in preferences. And it's always having to remember all the history states. You know, you have history and all that stuff, and it uses Image Cache for that and probably other things I don't even understand. If you choose that external drive to be your primary cache disk, Photoshop will run a lot faster because it will actually cache data faster on that external FireWire drive than it will on its internal drive because the internal drive is busy doing other things too. It's like multitasking where that external drive that you plug in only is doing one job. It's caching Photoshop for you. That's all it's doing. It'll go faster. And I happen to have two of those drives sitting next to my desk because I make a lot of stuff. And I hook them, daisy chain them up, and I have the first one is my primary cache, one's a secondary, and then my laptop's the third. And that'll get you a long way. So if you have a FireWire drive, you can try that. It'll speed things up for you. A little tech tip there, I guess. Um, so this thing, actually most of this animation was built in Photoshop. Photoshop has a timeline. CS3 does. The previous versions had a timeline, but it was kind of hidden in, a, in another program that came with it for free called Image Ready. Anybody ever notice, ever wonder what, the, what that thing was? <laughs> Image Ready? It's the way we used to build animations for websites years ago before Flash came along. And uh, <clears throat> what you can do in this Image Ready is you can turn layers on and off. You can make a new frame. You know, animations are frames, one frame after another linearly through time. And I can turn layers on and off frame by frame and animate the Photoshop file. So my original ideas would be sort of a documentation, documentary of how I built the print. If I had all the layers that I used, I could just turn them on and off, turn them on in sequence and it would just sort of document the whole process for me. So I did that. It looked like crap. <laughs> it just, I don't know, just Apparently, I don't work in any logical order <laughs> when I make these layers because the stuff was just flying all over the place and it just looked like random nonsense. So, but I still I had all the layers, so I you know I went to Plan B and tried to make some logic out of these layers and try to make something that maybe would you know make more visual sense. So really, the animation that I made was initially was probably uh, six or eight minutes long, and this is only a minute. I threw almost all of it away because it was just it was too busy. This animation is not meant to be watched. It's not what it's for. It's not, like, it's not TV, right? I don't want to compete with that. <laughs> it's meant to be like, you know, you're in the room, and it's operating like most of the pictures on your walls operate, if you're to be honest about it. They're peripheral. You, not too many people sit around on their couch and watch their pictures. <laughs> you know, not that they're not a critical element in the interior design of a, a space, but you don't sit there and watch them. They're there. They're peripheral for the most part. And so I wanted this to act the same way. 
just be peripheral, be decorative. And so there's different versions of the, uh, of the Photoshop file in here, and it's basically just fading in from one version to the other, you know. And, and this part here is you can kind of see where I turn layers on and the sort of making itself. And so I did probably 70% of the animation just in Photoshop that way. And then I brought it into a program called After Effects. Have you guys heard of Adobe After Effects? Um, I did not know how to use After Effects yet, so I thought, well, this will be an opportunity for me to learn that. And Casey helped me. I had a couple phone calls to Casey. Uh, where's that button for... <laughs> yeah. But um, in After Effects is where I did the little, even even like a lot of this flower where it kind of sizzles and stuff, that's just turning layers on and off, just making little Photoshop files and turning them on and off in the timeline. But whenever it, whenever it twirls and scales down and then explodes and then these rings that come out, that's in After Effects. And After Effects is really cool because it's just Photoshop that you can that you can animate more than you can animate in Photoshop. You can make things, um, you can, it has all the Photoshop tools, all the layers, all the layer modes and the filters and the colorizing, everything you can imagine in Photoshop. But on top of that, you can, you can twist things and blur them and mask them and make them move a lot, a lot more than you can make them move in Photoshop. Once you, it's like any other piece of software, once you get the few basics down, you can actually do quite a bit with it. And then there's also um, a three-dimensional space in After Effects with lighting that you can use, but they call it 2.5D. I think that's the right terminology for it. You can't put fully formed objects in the 3D space, but you can set up like stage sets, right? Like stage flats in the theater and have that kind of 3D space, and then you can have a camera. And uh, so I set it up that way. I took the flower, and I think in this element right here, in the background, three different levels. And I had cast shadows and all this stuff, and it just looked like hell. So I flattened it all back up again. But, <laughs> what, uh, <laughs> but what I did do, what I did allow me to do is once it's set up in 3D space, you can have real lights and you can animate the lights around. So basically what I was able to do, even after I flattened it back up, I left it at 3D even though it was flat and I had some lights. So it was kind of like taking a flashlight and you could shine it, moving it around and shining it on the picture like this and you can get the lights to kind of move around and be real ethereal that way. And so I did end up using that effect. So um, it's all pretty subtle, but I did a lot of moving of this light around in this sort of loop like this. And so the whole thing is sort of fading in and out and being kind of ethereal like that. Uh, you can't, you can't that emboss well, the emboss look is just, it's, I, did, I did that in, um, in After Effects too. It has the same emboss tool that Photoshop has, exact same one. So the, the thing I was trying to do here was see if I could get this to have some of the same characteristics that a, you would expect in a fine art print, which is crisp surface, right? You want to be able to usually get right up to that print and not have it get soft and fuzzy like a reproduction does. You know, if it's a, if it's a print, fine art print, it should never break down. It should be, be good all the way to the, to the surface. And... Um, and so I tried to, I put in, you know, a bunch of surface in here so that hopefully if somebody was to get close to it, they would feel like this surface was also interesting. You know, most, most video, when you get close to it, it gets pretty bad looking. You know, it's meant to be viewed from a distance. Uh, and it was a big challenge because at first I just had flat areas of colors, this gradients, and you ever see that, you know, you get that banding? Sometimes I had terrible banding because I had to come. The, the challenge with this kind of media right now is uh, you have to compress these animations down a lot to get them to run smoothly. So the raw version, uncompressed of this, each one of these was a couple of gigabytes, even though it's only a minute long. 
because it's high def. And uh, by the time I got it compressed down far enough that it would run on a computer, which is a lot of compression, I got all this banding. And it looked terrible, so I had to have this Band-Aid for my banding. <laughs> so I started throwing this. And the, the fix for that is always texture. Just throw texture on it, and it'll cover up the banding. If you were to look, if you really were to look hard at it, you could probably still see a little bit of, you can kind of see the banding starting to creep through there. It's just kind of covered up. So I learned a little about that. I learned that probably um, until the computer processors get faster, you're just not gonna you're not gonna be able to get the kind of super crisp surface that you get from a, like a fine art print on a on a screen, you know that same sort of characteristics, which I was hoping to get because. I'm presenting these in the, almost like a fine art print. It just happens to be for your big screen TV, if that makes any sense. <laughs> hmm? I used Sorensen, and I had to compress it all the way down to medium, which is a lot. Um, more than I use on web pages usually, but those are such little files that you know don't add up that much. I see. Oh, hundreds. hundreds. Yeah, and you put them in folders, you know, so they're organized. Yeah, hundreds. Hundreds. This is ridiculous. When it's when I flatten it, it's only like 150 megabytes. You know, it's not that big. And and like I said, I we print everything at 150 pixels per inch. You. Can, the only place you will tell the difference between a 300 and a 150 is in the very densely colored areas. You do see the color density lightens up a little bit in an area like, uh, you know, in an area like here where there's a lot of really dense color. But um, you can adjust for that by just doing a little curve. You know, like in 10 seconds, you can adjust for that in the computer. So. Uh, and you really only, you would really only know that that color density was different if you had something to compare it to, right? So if you have a, photographers notice that they they print at 300, and I and I think it kind of makes sense for them to do that probably more than me because they take a photo, and and they especially as a screen photographer they know what that photo would look like in the traditional printing process and they know what that color density is supposed to be like. So they have kind of a point of reference. And then when they print it at 150 and they see that the density is not really there for them in some areas, they're like, this is no good. Now, I would say, well, you could just adjust that with the curves. And they would say, that's not pure. <laughs> you know, let's just print it at 300 and it'll just be sort of a more pure process, I guess. You know, So I, I can understand that. But... Uh, but yeah, you can't. And I've done this. I've done the work. I mean, I've printed these out at the different resolutions. And I've, if you've ever been in one of my classes, you may have been somebody that I did this experiment on, <laughs> where I'll take the images and I'll shuffle them up and I'll say, all right, now pick the one that's 300, and can't do it. Can't tell the difference. And the difference in the file size is huge. At 300 versus 150, it's not just twice as big, it's four times as big, because it's exponential, because it's x times y, right? So you have four times as many pixels. So a 150 megabyte file goes to 600 megabytes. <laughs> and when you're buying hard drives, <laughs> you know, and you're waiting for things to transfer over FireWire drives, and you're saving stuff, and you're working with a lot of data, it starts to add up. The weight starts to matter. That you know. So, anybody else have any other questions? We probably should wrap it up, huh? So we can. Lunch. No, I'm that good in my explanations. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Because you've never seen anything like that before.
like the more research than, than I have, that this is an accepted um, form of media within fine art. Um, but I guess, especially because you're saying theirs aren't selling well with your store. And again, there's the difference with maybe the image not selling it or the you know, technology not selling it. But I guess I'm. Or the, or the internet might not be the place to I guess I'm sell it. Yeah. Or the fact that selling art in general is a really extremely hard thing to do, yeah. <laughs> there has to be, something has to give, right? Um, if, if, if there's a public perception of the reality that this is a cheaper and more expedient process, doesn't that also mean that it would have less value for people? Well, I would say that the Rauschenberg G. Clays don't have any problem selling, right? And they sell for, they sell for the same price that the Lithos did. Yeah. Not as a, not as awesome. No, not as a machine-made litho, yeah. So, you know, I mean, if I was Rauschenberg, we wouldn't even be having this conversation, right? <laughs> so, so, I mean, I guess when I say it's established in the marketplace, sure, I might not be a big hitter in that marketplace. I might not be that successful. But successful artists... Who have, who have been successful in, in selling prints are now successful selling these to the same people that used to buy the, the others for the same kind of prices. No, they're, they're made for Giclée. That's the only way they... I think that's the key. They only exist as Giclées. They may be drawings that were photographed. I know he did a series... I like Robert Longo, for instance. He's one of my favorite artists. He did a series of G. Clays of the, the big waves. Have you seen any of those in our books? The huge man-eating wave pictures? Anyway, um, he, he did though. He's a graphite artist in part, right? So he did them in the graphite, and then they photographed them, and then they, and then they, they took the digital file, and they enhanced the image again. In other words, they didn't just say, okay, we're done. They... They manipulated the image further, and then they destroy. You destroy the drawing, and then you you do uh, however many editions of that print, 50 or 100, and then you you supposed to destroy the file, too, and then that's it. They're done. The whole idea of uh, exclusivity in fine art to me has always been a little bit of a mystery. Anyway, I mean I understand it's an important part of the of the model. But for Christ's sake, you spend twenty thousand dollars for a car. You don't expect it to last ten years. You pay two hundred dollars for a lousy print. It's supposed to outlive you. I, you know, I've never understood that. <laughs> you know, it's about. I think it's about. Oh, I have this, and you, and you don't. You know what I mean? There's only ten of these, and I have one. Damn it! You know, kind of thing. It's a little elitist. The whole idea. Of, but I think if you want to sell prints for any amount of money. That's probably your only choice is to limit the edition because it's the only way you can get the value up to, you know, make any kind of money on them. So we do it. <laughs> Anybody want to have an opinion on that limited edition idea? No? <laughs> All right, should we wrap it up? Thank you very much for coming and listening to me. <laughs> I get all my stuff.